This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, isn't it about time your printer got smart too? Now printing is smart with HP+. And the HP Smart app is how it all happens. You can print from your phone with just a tap, no matter where you are. Even from your garage slash home office slash yoga studio. Huh, that is smart. HP+. Plus. Learn more about smart printing at hp.com slash smart. Hey everybody, this is Jason Buckland, and let me welcome you back to our podcast, In Conversation with Shopify Plus. Now, season one was all about the biggest names in business. Steve Madden, Danny Reese, Chip Wilson. But wait till you hear who we're talking to now for season two. Philip Prim, CEO, Casper. Webb Smith, founder, 2PM. Kyle Kadakia, founder, ClassPass. Heather Hassan, Trina Spear, co-founder, co-CEO, Fix. Chris Saka, co-founder, Lower Carbon Capital. Ariel K, CEO, Parachute. This is In Conversation with Shopify Plus. Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, welcome back to another episode of New Books on Japanese Studies, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I am Jing Yi Lee from the University of Arizona. This week, we're joined by Dr. Anthony Rausch and his new book, Resolving the Contemporary Tensions of Regional Places, What Japan Can Teach Us. Anthony is a social scientist teaching and researching at Hirosaki University in Japan. Uh, in this book, Anthony looks into several regional problems in Japan that have been resulted from contemporary circumstances such as urbanization and economic growth. As Anthony regards, these problems inform us of causes and solutions for similar issues in other areas of the world. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you for joining the um New books on Japanese studies channel today. Well, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, so I understand that this project started when when you were still an MA student. Do you still remember how you got interested into this topic? Well, I, I guess I would say it's not necessarily a topic per se, as much as it's uh, sort of a trajectory of an academic career. Um, I arrived in Aomori Prefecture about thirty years ago spent about a year uh, teaching at an English conversation school in Hirosaki City, uh, then decided to go to graduate school uh, in social sciences at Hirosaki National University. And that is where my interest in my local place, both on a personal level, but more so on an academic or a a social science level, uh, that began. And... um, you know, we, we refer to things like books as projects, but in fact, this one is more uh, a combination of that long-term trajectory of work I began a long time ago, actually on volunteerism, uh, and some more recent uh, issues that have arisen uh, more contemporarily. Um, so, you know, over that, those, whatever it was, 25 years of getting my master's degree here, uh, getting my PhD in Monash, actually, um, with Ross Maurer um, working on Japanese studies. Um, it's been a continuation and an accumulation is perhaps a better word. Uh, so this book represents an accumulation of a lot of things uh, that have uh, I've been interested in and that I have noticed over the, over the course of my career. That's very nice. And you, so you wrote a whole book about Taomori and Hirosaki City, which part of Aomori attracted you so much? Um, well, I mean, it attracted in terms of how did I wind up here. Um, that was just luck. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of us wind up in places we never expect, and it's, a, it's a difficult sometimes to explain how we wound up there. In terms of uh, Aomori and Hirosaki uh, as the basis of the book, um, being here... Uh, gave me an opportunity to uh, see things that a lot of other people didn't see. A lot of people see Japan as Tokyo. Uh, Obviously, I'm at the opposite extreme. Uh, Aomori Prefecture is one of the uh, least sort of economically viable, you might almost say socially viable places contemporarily, but it has a very, very rich uh, history in Japanese feudal history. Um, We still have a, 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 a castle park. Um, one of the few castle park that remains actually in Tohoku. Um, so the the place is inherently interesting. 
Um, that's part of what comes out in the book. The place also exhibits a lot of tensions that you don't necessarily see or think about when you think about Japan. So from a social science perspective, it's a very interesting place. Uh, the question is the degree to which the issues that are taking place here uh, are relevant and meaningful to perhaps other places, whether those places might be within Asia to contribute to Asian studies, uh, area studies, um, rural studies. Um, the, the question then is how to translate what's happening here into something meaningful for other social scientists. That's very impressive. I, I When I first got the book, I was actually a little bit surprised that you uh, took upon, upon Aomori Prefecture because I think this is the first book that I've ever read that dealt with Aomori. So in a way, it's um, quite innovative. I appreciate and, that. <laughs> yeah. So another interesting aspect of this book is that you self-published it. Uh, I believe this is the first sub self-published book that we have ever featured in the Japanese Studies channel. So why did you choose to do so? And how did you like the process comparing to traditional publication procedures through academic publishers or university publishers? Hmm. Yeah, um, I have published um, with major academic publishers. I've published with Brill. I've published... Um, with the Rutledge Contemporary Jap Japan series. Um, I've published through Cambria and Tenio, uh, which are sort of independent presses. Um, a lot of those publications have also focused on rural Japan. I should say all of those pretty much have focused on rural Japan, uh, with Aomori Prefecture being a big part of the contents. Um, I guess, I guess so the, 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 uh, the contrast is that the main point with regard to the book that we're going to talk about today is I wanted it to be very accessible, and I also was looking at it um, from sort of a timeliness question. Now, when I say accessible, I was thinking under 40,000 words. I think the book is actually about 36,000 words. Um, whereas most publications are about 80 to 100, maybe 150,000 words. Um, and I also didn't want to go through a very lengthy review process, and I'll make reference to that um, as, I, as I continue here. Um, now, there are academic publishers, or, or, or I should say mainstream, you know, big-name publishers that do have, uh, what do I want to say, um, the uh, short uh, volume or the low volume, the the the, the say under forty thousand word uh, manuscripts and books that they have. Um, but if you look at those uh, those books and the list that they have, I think the Japanese focus. I did actually try with a couple of publishers, and the Japanese focus was a little bit too uh, strict or too uh, too narrow for them. Um, they didn't think that it would would be uh, justified with that sort of a uh, even with a, a limited length format. Um, so then I sort of looked and I said, well, I don't really want to spend a lot of time. I think that some of the issues in this book are very timely. Uh, so I just thought I'm going to go with this. Uh, I'm going to do it myself. Um, however, uh, in terms of looking at sort of the gate, gatekeeper function, and that's where a lot of academic presses do have a very, very important uh, gatekeeping function, one of the things that uh, I was sort of taught and I've sort of used as my operational manual or operational procedure is to always publish what you publish. So a lot of the work that wound up in the books that I have published came from journal publications. Um, even at 8,000 or 10,000 words, a journal publication still doesn't give you the opportunity to fully you know, detail and contextualize and extend your argument. So even with this current book, although it hasn't gone through what I would you know, refer to as the academic gate gatekeeping review process, most of the material that I have contributed, that I have done, has been vetted through some sort of publication format. Um, the older issues, which we'll talk about, of course, when we get to them, um, those have been vetted over the sort of the length of my career. Some of the newer, more contemporary issues came through uh, 
a series of articles that I wrote for the online magazine Tokyo Review. Um, now, Tokyo Review uh, gives us a perfect example of the limitations of sort of real-time publishing as you go. Um, they have a, an article limit of, I think it's 1,200 words, um, which just gives you no room to maneuver. It's just, you know, you just have to really focus down. Um, so obviously I felt that what I produced for that uh, online magazine wasn't sufficient, and that's what sort of put me in the mindset of taking what I had done there, which was vetted, and putting it into this book form, but I didn't necessarily want to you know, spend a thousand, a uh, hundred thousand words on it. I, in fact, I mean, I just really wasn't ready to do that. Um, that would have been, that would have constituted a full project type of mindset, which I really didn't, didn't um, go that far with it. Um, so the, you know, to, to sort of summarize and cut to the chase, uh, this new world we live in where we can self-publish through Kindle, it, it really opens up a lot of possibilities. I think it's wonderful. The only thing that I would say to people who are thinking of doing it is make sure that you find some mechanism through which you can really police yourself uh, to maintain the integrity of your work, um, whether that's having you know your colleagues read it in a very informal way or whether trying to publish some work in a shorter form through a vetted academic journal and then bringing several of those together in this work. Um, I do really think that some sort of gatekeeping mechanism, whether it's external or internal, is still very, very important. I'm sure. Um, I, I think our uh, new books, no, actually not new books, the Academic Life channel would be very interested in talking to you about this whole process. And personally, I'm very jealous that you are able to do so. <laughs> I don't imagine when I actually become a junior scholar, I'll get to self-publish my dissertation or anything, but let's jump into the book. Okay, I appreciate uh, that. Yes, I was deeply fascinated by this research topic because one of my life goals is to retire in the suburb in Japan somewhere. So what are the regions that you focus on in this book? Well, I guess we sort of answered that question, that's Aomori Prefecture. And so do we? what do we need to know about these places that you talk about before getting into the uh, meat of the book? Yeah, that's a very interesting dimension to any discussion like this um, and any work that you know, emerges from a place. Um, this is the one of the major contentions of area studies. Um, we go into a place, we live in that place, we look at that place, we identify issues. Of course, those issues are contextualized within the, that place, the history, the culture. Then the question is, to what degree do those stories do those issues uh, relate? How uh, universal are they? How meaningful to other uh, area studies researchers that are looking at similar areas or generalists, area studies, people who look you know, global to specialists who look at rural studies? And that's the, that's the key. Um, now, Aomori is a relatively unique place. It does have a very powerful connection to the historical, uh, political, and cultural centers of Japan, but uh, by virtue of its geographic location um, and its inaccessibility, it was very much cut off. Um, I mean, the Shinkansen service has only been to actually the prefecture, through the prefecture, has only been the last 10 years or something like that. Um, the airport... Uh, was put in a place where uh, I would say one third of the flights when I first arrived here had to go back to Tokyo because the fog and the weather conditions in the winter. Um, so it was this isolated area of Japan, um, primary industries. Uh, it has its own language, Sugaru Ben, the dialect. So it is this relatively isolated place and it has long been sort of a, a, a white spot on the map. I would go down to Tokyo and I would say I'm from Aomori and people would say, gee, I've heard of that place, but I know nothing about it. Um, so it's a very interesting laboratory. Uh, but in that, then it gives us, say, for example, one of the chapters we'll talk about deals with Sugaru Lacquerware and Sugaru Shamisen. And those are two very concentrated and isolated cultural industries um, that had been cut off pretty much from the rest of the world, of course, the rest of Japan. 
Um, so their trajectories do tell a very, very interesting story. Um, the region at large, of course, is Japan. So we put Aomori Prefecture within Japan. And I think there are a lot of people, a lot of social scientists, um, uh, who those who know Japan recognize that it is uh, in a way at the forefront of a lot of issues that advanced nation states are facing, aging population, uh, mobility, geographic mobility, economic mobility, um, how certain places become sort of fossilized in their own place and cut off from other places as Tokyo becomes this global megatropolis, places like Aomori are somewhat cut off. So of course, Japan as a nation uh, the central government is crafting solutions to respond to that. So uh, both Japan as a, as, a, as a nation is the place I'm focusing on because it's facing problems other countries will face. But then within Japan, we have this very uh, interesting case study in Aomori, which is not really Nagano, you know, because Nagano had the Olympics. It's not really uh, a place like Sendai, um, or a place like Totori, which have different you know, cultural trajectories and are successful or in some cases unsuccessful uh, for different reasons, but for similar reasons. But Aomori does tell a very interesting story. As I was reading your book, I couldn't help but remember um, when I was... So I spent a year living in Saga, which is a, uh, a, sort, an, a southern city on the Kyushu Island. Mm. And many of the problems that you mentioned here, um, I saw similar issues when I was in Saga. And so it was kind of, it, it had this familiar feeling um, um, to it. So what are the main issues discussed in this book? If you could just give us a brief um, overview of it. Yeah, um, the way that I set up the table of contents, and I, I spent a lot of time on this trying to figure out how to do this, was to create sort of your, your main heading and then a subheading. And the main heading, uh, pretty much the first word is regional. So it's regional relocation, regional finance and leadership, regional tax, regional tax inequality, regional revitalization. Uh, in my case, looking at that regional revitalization through the idea of a cultural economy, and then regional relevance, contemporary regional relevance. To a degree, those main headings do indicate what each chapter is about. But as I said, some uh, have a more historical or a, a longer trajectory. Some are very current. Regional revitalization um, has to do, of course, with how people move within the country. But I'm focusing actually on something called the Akia Bank. Uh, finance. Regional banks are struggling. I mean, there's a lot of news about how regional banks are struggling. Um, and I try to link that up with some work that I did on local think tanks. Uh, tax inequalities comes out of the Furosato Noze tax system. I think I'm probably one of the few people that have actually published on that extensively in English. Um, as I said, the revitalization through this idea of cultural economics, place identity, and then regional relevance, relevance, excuse me, regional relevance. Uh, I decided to focus on universities because obviously I'm at a university, and then volunteerism, which is a theme that I have studied really since my master's degree. Um, and Japanese uh, volunteerism has gone through you know, this tremendously complex trajectory from disaster to social welfare, back to disaster, to regional identity. It's just a, it's a really interesting area. So those are the areas, relocation, finance, leadership, taxes, and revitalization, then looking at universities and volunteerism. That's great. So perhaps we can start with relocation then. Certainly. Yeah, so usually we assume that people relocate from rural to urban areas for all kinds of reasons like job opportunities, education, perhaps even family. In chapter one, you point out that the actual situation is much more complicated than this. Can you talk about what the case is with the example of Hirosaki City and what are some of the me measures that the city is taking? 
Well, as you mentioned, and I, I was actually going to go through that list as well, but you've done it, thank you. I mean, uh, usually we do look at it as from rural to urban. Um, there's a Japanese term, which maybe you know, which is dekasegi, uh, which is the term of, you know, leaving your, your home area and going working in the city, f- you know, for whether it's a year, seasonally, whatever it is, and making trips back. Um, and there are many, many reasons why people do that. But um, there are also uh, recently reasons why people are looking to come back, the quality of life, raising children. Uh, of course, through one's life course, a lot of people return to their furosato, their home area, to care for aged uh, parents and things like that. Um, so there's a, there's a tremendous complexity in that movement. Um, the responses, of course, uh, most prefectures and most municipal governments uh, have established sort of the returnee enticement uh, policies, and they they're opening up offices, and they on virtually any municipality homepage you will find uh, one particular uh, site on the homepage uh, giving all the information about how to return. Um, I don't want to say that's old news. It certainly is still contemporary. Um, it is something that one could could do a lot with. Um, I did a little bit of that in one of the Tokyo Review articles, but my interest actually was was really focused uh, then in the latter half of this chapter on the Akia Bank. Um, And the Akia problem um, is an increasingly visible and increasingly detrimental problem. Akia just simply means vacant place or vacant house, vacant property. Uh, the problem, of course, is that when people leave and then say uh, an agent parent dies, uh, no one is there to take care of the house. Uh, in some cases, even taxes aren't paid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, weeds grow, roofs fall in, um, the place falls into disrepair. So what the municipal and national governments have done sort of in cooperation of the, is, is that they've created a national database. Um, now, the database and a lot of the framing and the terminology and a lot of the success stories seem to be predicated on returnees. So somehow Akia Bank has been tied into the issue of returning. Uh, my view on it is that they're missing a tremendously important local potential, which is there are a lot of young people who would like to have starter housing of course, uh, housing in Japan is very expensive. The, the property value is very expensive. The building of the house is very expensive. So you might even, I don't want to extend this argument that far, but you might even say a lot of people leave because they don't have housing. They don't have attractive housing. So if they were to or reorganize the Akia Bank, not I don't want to say they want to ignore the national level to it, but if they were to reorganize it, and sort of ramp it up on a local level, I would think that there would be a lot of local people, young people with families who would like to get into starter housing. And that's where I see the potential for Akia Bank to contribute to its own community. Rather than bringing people in from somewhere else, make life better for young people in the community. That's quite interesting. I know that recently, uh, at least in Tokyo, um, these kind of deserted or abandoned houses, and in uh, Kyoto actually, these kind of houses are becoming more popular with young people so that they can turn it into maybe a hipster cafe or something. I guess that's one solution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could do that locally as well. One thing for me, of course, is that cities always tend, I've found that most of the municipalities um, tend to look outside for population. The, democ- the, the uh, no, demography uh, equation always includes this, we have to bring people in from outside, um, which is not mistaken, but I think there's a little more room in that equation for we really need to keep people here. Um, Now, people leave for education and return. That's the whole sort of, you know, U-turn thing. Um, But U-turns often wind up being J-turns where they leave Aomori and they wind up back in Miyagi. Um, So I think the thing is to really uh, keep the young people here, um, and I'm probably talking sort of post-education people, uh, young people who uh, maybe go to Tokyo for education, come back here, and they say, yes, 
I can open up a coffee shop. I can have an a inexpensive house and to raise a family. Um, and I'm not going to wind up paying uh, my mortgage for the next 40 years, which is quite daunting nowadays. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a little tweaks that I think a, a more local Akia Bank program could do to improve life locally. That's very interesting. And this next chap chapter, um, you focus on think tanks, in particular the messy situation, let's say, of regional think tanks, such as what they actually do and how they do it. Can you tell us more about this? Well, this is something that I actually just started. Um, and I started it because there was an article in my local newspaper that said the think tank, which I had all, every month I had purchased their magazine, um, uh, was uh, going to be discontinued and the, uh, its fate uncertain. Now, after six months, it was picked up uh, and it got new support. But that really kind of got my interest into what are these local think tanks. Um, and as I looked into it more and more, there's actually not been much written on local think tanks, uh, very little in Japanese, um, virtually nothing in English. Um, and if you look at the think tanks, um, of course, the, the biggest question in even the broadest uh, literature on think tanks is the problem of definition. What constitutes a think tank? Um, so when you bring that then down to the local level, um, we have uh, think tanks that are funded through local banks. We have think tanks that are initiated directly by local governments. These obviously help to formate, formulate local policy. There are special... Uh, interest think tanks, a think tank that is committed to wi uh, wind-powered uh, energy uh, up on the uh, Tsugaru Peninsula coastline, um, because, of course, they have lots of wind generators up there because the wind is always blowing. Well, they have a think tank uh, that is to dedicated to this. So there's this incredibly chaotic uh, sort of reality of think tanks uh, I would say in rural Japan, again, I'm just looking at my area, the, the problem is it's virtually, as I said, it's chaotic. I mean, it's totally disorganized. Um, and if you connect that in a way, I, I would think if you connect that to some of the troubles that you see regional banks going through, um, I would think that that's a very sort of synergistic combination of banks that can look to very well-informed local leadership uh, to identify where finance opportunities might be. Um, I, I, just, I, just, I just see that there's a very weak link there, and I think that link could be better. Um, of course, my problem is I don't really do a lot of banking, so I'm not really sure what the banking argument is you know, at its core. But think tanks, that I can sort of get my mind around, and I can say I, I would believe that this is an area of tremendous potential for some young researcher just to really say regional think tanks in Asian countries um, would be a very, very, uh, uh, it's an area of research with lots of potential. The world is racing to get back to normal and start meeting up in person again. But after the year we've all had, getting back to feeling normal takes time. If you're feeling overwhelmed by it all, you're not alone. Something like 50% of Americans struggle with their mental health. We all need help sometimes. I know I do. So what should you do? Well, you should ask for help. Talkspace makes it easy to get that help. Talkspace matches you with a licensed therapist and makes it easy to schedule live video sessions, all from the comfort of your device. You can start messaging your therapist the same day you sign up, and you work with your therapist on your own schedule without having to wait weeks for appointments. Whether you're a parent, a student, a millennial, or just someone having a hard day, Talkspace can help you feel better. Talkspace offers individual and couples therapy in addition to medication prescription services. Whether you're experiencing depression, anxiety, or other problems, Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform to help you sort through any issue. Start feeling better with a single message. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code NBN. That's $100 off when you use the code NBN at Talkspace.com. Awesome. I hope our listeners are taking notes of this. <laughs> <laughs> and next, you talk Ooh. about something that I'm personally quite interested in, which is the regional tax system that's usually called Furusato Noze which literally means hometown tax donation. Can you briefly introduce how it works first? 
I will try to briefly, as briefly as I can, and I, and I think I have cut it down, so someone who knows a lot about this might be listening and think, wait a minute, you skipped over a few points there. But basically, when you pay your taxes, uh, if you go to one of, either you go to a, a municipality or a prefectural site, they will usually direct you to a privately managed Furo Sato Noze site, and that site will then walk you through uh, the procedure by which you are allowed allowed to uh, redirect a portion, I believe it's now up to 20%, or I should say maybe down to 20%. Um, there's been a, a few legal adjustments in the, in the program. Um, you're allowed to uh, redirect about 20% of your tax burden to a municipality of your choice. Uh, the original idea was that uh, people who had relocated might be able to sort of pay back to their furosato, hence the name for Osato uh, tax system. Um, of course, uh, it soon, it's, as you are free to redirect your taxes to virtually any municipality throughout Japan, uh, it soon became a very competitive system and uh, every municipality wants to get these you know, tax redirections and tax contributions. So they started to give a gift back well, of course, once that was sort of allowed within the program, uh, winners won and losers lost. I mean, all those municipalities that had very attractive uh, local products or a local cultural commodity or something like that could give back a very high value, highly desirable gift. Those places without such fate, without the benefits of such fate, uh, would would to to some degree lose out on that opportunity. Obviously, some people did redirect their taxes back to their home community, but a lot of other people used it as sort of a big giant shopping program uh, subsidized by the Japanese national government. So it, it it's a program that's very well intentioned, but the reality of it is it hasn't worked out so well. That makes so much sense now because i had seen this system featured in japan's variety shows a lot and usually it's some host introducing a local specialty food or art crafts and then the show would talk about how the audience can get them simply through paying tax to their regional government it didn't make much sense to me back then that by paying, ta by paying tax one can get the return prize things like a5 rank wagyu beef or rare matsutake mushrooms so i guess it sounds like there's a lot of potential problems with it yeah and i thank you for 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 providing those very concrete examples i i didn't know if i should say kobe beef here um <laughs> if there's any licensing problems or something or something i don't even know about um so yeah i mean the intent was was, was very good um uh but there is a larger argument at work here. Um, of course, uh, the program itself can be viewed on its intent, uh, the merits of that intent. Uh, it can also then be criticized on the outcome, which is all very clear. I think we can sort of look at the, uh, at the way that the numbers go. Um, and there, there's, a, there's another uh, negative outcome of this, which, like I said, I could keep talking about this, but I don't want to go too long. One of the problems is there's a significant population in, for example, Setagaya Q in Tokyo that would like to get that Kobe beef. So, of course, they take 20% of their tax burden and they shift it to Kobe. Well, that leaves Setagaya Q in the red in terms of their taxes. I mean, not only do you sort of allow people to go shopping, again, underwritten by the Japanese government, and you're also allowing uh, sort of a middleman in there, these private web, uh, web content providers to manage it all. You're also taking money away from a municipality that needs that for their budget. So you get tremendous fiscal disparities across the, the, the tax map of Japan. But at a larger, a larger, it's not the word I want to use, at a more abstract level, um, I would argue that this is a continuation of sort of the Koizumi uh, neoliberalization of Japanese government. Basically, the central government is saying, hey, 
you know, we're not really responsible for the equal distribution of tax revenue. We're just going to leave it up to the market. Let the people decide, which is, of course, a very uninformed view. It's also, again, a very market view. And, and I just see the, the domain of taxes should be something that is controlled, managed, it, the, the intentions, the outcomes. It should be the central government that is managing a national tax system. Um, this, of course, is a very abstract argument. It sort of gets us away from that concrete cause and effect type of, of uh, dynamic, which is very clear to most people. But to me, that, that's a very, very important argument as well. Um, so this, this uh, Filosato Nose, if we look at the Almori map, it probably has been a blessing for a handful of municipalities and an actual like stake through the heart of their of their you know fiscal stability for other uh, municipalities. So it, it's really uh, I I view it as a very problematic approach to governing. So just out of curiosity, when you pay tax to Alma Prefecture, what can what kind of goods can you get in return? Well, Aomori Prefecture, I mean, I don't really know that that many people actually, well, I actually provide to Aomori Prefecture. I would actually have, I've never actually looked at the prefectural map, to tell you the truth. I always look at the municipal map. So if you were to, to uh, uh, donate, uh, redirect, I'm sorry, redirect your contributions to Hirosaki City, you would primarily get apples. Um, and of course, Hirosaki City would underwrite the entire cost of, you know, boxing these apples and, you know, this, getting them to Aomori is the number one apple producer in Japan. Um, so, of course, everybody wants beautiful Fuji and Sugaru apples, which are very, very expensive. That's the number one thing that uh, Hirosaki uh, uh, would provide. Um, Hachinohe, you would probably get very good seafood. Um, if you were interested in lacquerware, um, Tsugaru Nuri lacquerware is very, very expensive, but that is, of course, one of the one of the, uh, the the gifts that you would get back. But of course, just forty kilometers up the road. Now, granted, there's a population uh, disparity here as well, but you have the the, the town of uh, Goshongawara. Uh, it's actually a city by virtue of population. Uh, but anyway, um, and my wife is actually from Goshongawara, and I hope I don't. Uh, pay for saying what I'm going to say. Goshogawara is one of those uh, cities in rural Japan that pretty much has nothing. I mean, it's it's just a, a city out on the plain. It's got very good rice, but the rice can't really compete with Akita and Niigata rice. And, uh, and it's it's one of those places that looks at something like Furuhato Nose and says, we're going to lose every time. And, you know, that's the dynamic that's happening up here. Well, I'm going to keep that part about lacquerware in mind. <laughs> um, so this ties into the next two chapters of your book, which essentially discuss how and why local institutions are trying so hard to push forward regional revitalization. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the roles of university in this, because I remember hearing universities in Japan talking about their, their reluctance to digitalize rare materials in order to attract scholars from both both Japan and overseas to come to their cities and towns, therefore to benefit regional revitalization, or chihosose as they called it. So what common ways are there for local governments to promote their local culture or to revitalize their local um, regions? And why are they relying on universities to do so? It's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Um, of course, traditionally, you you uh, regional places depended on you know extractive industries and whatnot, um, and that was you know pretty much all they had. Um, a, a national system, you know, put uh, national universities in outlying places. Um, one of the potentials of that dynamic is that national places can valorize certain aspects of culture which wouldn't other, otherwise be valorized. But of course, valorization demands understanding. Uh, so there has to be sort of that two-step process. We need to know what it is. We need to know about it. And then we have to create some sort of value mechanism. Um, 
<clears throat> that sort of process is sort of outside the economic realm. It really doesn't happen by virtue of straight up economics. So universities provide that mechanism. Um, now, one of the realities, of course, of university, uh, being a faculty member, is publish or perish and you know, get your name out there. And quite often, uh, that focus on local culture doesn't really bring you all that much on a national or an international level. It's relatively inward looking. So it really doesn't do that much to add to your research record or anything like that. Now, add on to this uh, the fact that uh, unlike, say, for example, America, which I know a, a bit about, uh, the funding for national universities is, is virtually controlled almost, I would say, 100 uh, percent by the Ministry of Education. There's a little bit of local you know, funding that's sought out out here. Um, so the, the, the central bureaucracy has a tremendous amount of power over what universities get. Uh, the universities have to, in, in, a, in essence, do what the central government wants them to do in order to get the money. Well, of course, Japan has sort of concentrated its focus in uh, sort of becoming a global acad academic powerhouse on a select few universities, leaving a lot of the outlying universities sort of with their hands in the air, wondering what to do because we're not getting a lot of sort of cost of living type of money. We're not getting a lot of research grants out of the central government, whatnot. So it's sort of what, what I'm sort of saying about local universities and how they can become relevant is for them to accept the fate that they will probably not be relevant on a global scale. Um, it's sort of a, a harsh reality that I don't think a lot of people uh, want to accept as they embark on their university career, uh, but accepting that and then focusing uh, and hopefully the, the central bureaucracies would recognize that these regional universities are doing that. And f these local faculty members would really work on, uh, as, as again, I, the word I would need to use is valorizing this local culture, uh, not so much for an external audience. Um, I, I have one chapter in the book about Tsugaru Nuri, Tsugaru Lacquerware, Tsuguri, Tsugaru Nuri, Nuri is the word for Lacquerware, and Tsugaru Shamisen. And these are both highly local uh, cultural commodities is the word that I use. Um, one which is incredibly successful, Tsugaru Shamisen has gone global. It's very dynamic. It has done that with virtually no help from the central government, no help from the local government. Sagaru Nuri Lakuwa, on the other hand, has enjoyed a tremendous amount of national exposure. Uh, uh, it has been designated a cultural property, uh, prefecturally, locally. We all know that. Part of that comes from the university focus that it was provided. Uh, but it still languishes. Um, and I would contend that the sort of the the academic community and perhaps the municipal community that looked at that only went as far as creating a base of understanding. They said, oh, now we know what it is. But they didn't valorize it. They didn't create value for it in a multidimensional sense. Uh, one of the things that I said way back at the beginning was that uh, Tsugaru Nuri lacquerware is usually used in cups and bowls and dishes and chopsticks. It has expanded to picture frames and various other items. But one of the glaring misses that they, they never picked up on was that I would have promoted a Tsugaru lacquerware house where the lacquerware was embedded into all of its functional and aesthetic potential as a total element in that house, which would have valorized the lacquerware not at an item level, but at a more sort of uh, total life unit level. And I'm not using the right terminology, but I think everyone will understand. And that's one of the, one of the places where I would say this academic community, the municipal community, even the business community, all the local construction companies, nobody ever said, we should put Sugaru Nudi into this house in every functional form that we can find. Because it's virtually indestructible, it's antiseptic, uh, it's easy to clean, 
uh, you know, you can repair it if, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that it has a tremendous value if you define it in a way that it has value. Uh, but it was never valorized in that sense. So I look at universities, and Sagaru Lacquer is just one example. And I also do want to say there are regional universities that have succeeded in this. Um, there is a university, and I don't remember where it is. It's I think it's a Shikoku University, which really branded itself as the Tuna Research University. And I think you must be Kinky University. Kinky University is <laughs> yes. what it was. And thank you for that. You know, and that's an example how the university sort of accepted its fate, and it didn't try to be what it couldn't be. Now, once again, we do have to recognize that not every you know. A national university in every prefecture is going to succeed as well as Kinky University did, but at at least they will create a presence in their own community, um, and and I, I really believe that that's something that um, a lot of universities have failed to recognize, even while. As much as I sometimes question the the Ministry of Education's my policies and their operational mindset and how they uh, force certain things. I, I expect that maybe they're right on this one. They have recognized that this is a, a reality that regional universities need to face. They need to be relevant in their own community. That's the most important key. Indeed, I totally agree. It's actually one of the greatest concerns in literary study as well, because a lot of uh, local universities try to focus too much on regional figures and regional writings. But honestly, most scholars from other areas of Japan or other parts of the world don't care as much as they do. So their publications kind of just sit there on the shelf. It's really a painful thing to watch. But now that we have talked about all these problems that result, all resulted from, well, mostly resulted from urbanization, what conclusions would you draw from these problems? And most importantly, what implications do you think they have to offer for other countries and other areas who might be experiencing similar problems, if if not already? Yeah, um, this does, of course, beg the reason for the book. Um, what you know, what value is there in simply identifying these problems, saying, you know, this is what we have going on here. Um, identification of problems is important. Um, part of identifying problem implies framing problems. As I said, Akia is always always fra- the, the, the vacant house problem, and the Akia Bank is often framed as bringing people from Tokyo, where what I'm trying to say is if we sort of reframe some of those problems, we create an alternative frame where the Akia Bank is not a mechanism to bring people from far away. The Akia Bank is a way to make life better for people who want to start the journey in this town. Um, So there's that very local uh, mechanism Uh, with each of the issues looked at uh, in isolation and hopefully identification and reframing might trigger that mindset of reframing issues anywhere. So I I don't want to say the specificity is lost uh, because the specificity is Akia and Akia Bank, but it gives us an opportunity to say we do need to consider that the way we frame things or the way things are framed for us often causes us to miss other opportunities. So that's sort of the single issue implication. I would say uh, the larger implication is that there is uh, a synergy. Uh, between a lot of the issues here. The problem is the degree to which that synergy is inherently apparent um, in that think tanks could provide leadership for global, uh, for local businesses uh, if they're activated by some process a little bit more effectively um, versus some synergy which we almost need to create. Um, 
for example, I don't know if there is an Akia think tank, but I mean, that would be one of those synergies that might be created where people uh, who really know sort of the geographical potential of how the city has grown in the past and, you know, where the city could grow most easily could sort of prioritize a, a certain area and the Akia uh, properties that exist in that area. So there's a certain synergy there that in a sense has to be created. Um, I, I do... I, I don't actually look that much at governance as governance is. Uh, one of the things I need to say at this point in the uh, interview, it's maybe too late, but I uh, see I'm in a faculty of education. Um, I sort of wound up in a faculty of education. So my day job is teaching English, uh, going and doing in-service training for in-service teachers at local schools and things like that. Um, so I actually don't spend a lot of my day hours, say, for example, going and looking at how Hirosaki City uh, operates, I just don't have that much time to commit to that. So I cannot really say the degree to which a municipality is inherently synergistic. But knowing what I know about Japan and knowing what I know about how Hirosaki University operates, a lot of Japanese institutions are very, what I want to say, um, they're very turf-oriented. I mean, uh, they're very uh, provincial in that they each have their own particular way and they stove-type a lot of information vertically. Um, and if that is the case, and I'm sure that the, some of your listeners are going to say, yes, yes, I've studied that, then this idea of creating synergy not within governance, but synergy across a lot of these uh, quite separate issue-based themes. I mean, I'm not even creating synergy between banking and business. I'm saying creating synergy between the Akia problem and the status of think, bank, think tanks, which is, I, I would suspect, at a fairly abstract level. How do you create synergy between issues? You create synergy between people and between offices and between sections and between institutions. But what I'm trying to say is if we can try to create some sort of synergy at the issue level, that hopefully will then filter down to synergy uh, in the efforts that the actors within the institutions managing those issues, uh, there will be synergy at that level. So that's the implication or that's the 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 macro level theme I'm trying to push. That's really that's a very nice thought, and I certainly hope that one day this can happen to cities like Saga mm. as well. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. I certainly appreciate appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, the well thought out questions. Obviously, you looked through it and you really put together some good questions for me. So I appreciate that on your part, Jing Li. Thank you. I did try. <laughs> um, so, listeners, this is Dr. Anthony Rausch and his new book, "Resolving the Contemporary Tensions of Regional Places: What Japan Can Teach Us." I am Jing Li from the New Books in Japanese Studies, and I will see you next week. <laughs>